When I was younger, I would go visit my grandparents all the time. They lived in a one floor house with an unfinished basement. I never liked it down there. It felt small for a big basement. There was a little door down there that was for storage and I always got a horrible feeling when going close to it. Let me add that this was a newer house that was about six years old. Now, during the time that I was about six or seven, I felt so uncomfortable going down there. Even when I was with someone, I didn't like it. I remember going down there with my grandma to help with something. She had to run upstairs because someone rang the doorbell and she said she would be right back even though she knew how I felt about being alone down there. But I nodded and said, okay. She was gone and I was alone, and I started to get a bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. I didn't move and I didn't want to. Even though the lights were on now, it still just felt wrong. Now this is where everything started happening and it still gives me chills. The lights started to flicker and I started to hear noises and what sounded like talking. It wasn't coming from upstairs though, it was coming from the storage room. I heard somebody say my name and this is the part that really freaks me out the most. The voice sounded like my grandma, but I was confused because how am I hearing her from the storage room when she's upstairs? I didn't want to move, but me being the curious one I am, I started moving toward the storage room door. The closer I got, the worse the bad feeling became. When I got to the door, the lights turned off in the basement. I wanted to run upstairs and hide, go home somewhere that wasn't the basement. I heard my name again for the second time, my grandma's voice asking me to open the door to help her. So I did, and I regret it. I couldn't see anything. It was pitch black. And at first, I couldn't hear anything anymore. But then I heard this faint laughing that felt like forever. But then the laughing stopped and the lights turned back on in the basement, and I felt a little bit better with them back on. On the downside, I could now see into the little storage room. I saw a small clown doll, and my grandma hates clowns with a passion and wants nothing to do with them. So why there's a clown doll, I have no idea. But it was certainly not my grandma's doing. Then the lights turned on in the storage room. I saw red that looked like blood all over the place. I screamed and blacked out, and the next thing I knew, I was laying on the couch. My grandma was looking at me and asking me if I was okay. I have no idea if that was all real or if I had passed out earlier and it was some kind of dream, but it sure as hell felt real. If you have any ideas as to what I experienced, let me know. This happened when I was about nine or 10 years old and I was really into soft stuffed animals. My step grandma was rich and pretty close with my sisters and I and lived close to us. So we would see her and my grandpa quite often and she spoiled us. We went to a store, not a secondhand store or anything, but I don't remember what store it was. There was a shelf of lambs with cute outfits covered in plastic flowers with what I think was actual wool covering them. They were very cute and soft, and I immediately knew that I had to have one. I asked my grandma and she gave it to me. I was delighted and I brought the lamb everywhere I went for a while. After a few days, I sat the lamb on top of a little toy chest at the foot of my bed. One morning, I was asleep, but I woke up to the sun streaming in on my face. I looked around my room and my lamb was pacing around next to my bed. 
It looked like it didn't have much control over its limbs, so it was kind of stumbling. It circled around, and eventually it was facing me. It looked me in the face, and I don't remember anything after that. I woke up later, and the lamb was where I had left it, sitting on the toy chest at the foot of my bed. I was so afraid that I buried the lamb under all of my other stuffed animals inside the toy chest, and I tried my very best to never look at it. A few years later, my grandma died of leukemia, and I felt extra guilty about the lamb, since it was a gift from her. But I told my mom about what happened, and she said I should just get rid of it. I donated the lamb to Goodwill, so hopefully it's not actually possessed, because then I just made it someone else's problem. Probably everyone reading this is convinced that it was just a dream. And you're probably right. But if it was, it was one of the most vivid dreams I have ever had. It took place in my bed, where I was lying down. My messy room had all the same things sitting on the floor, as in real life. And every time I saw the lamb after it happened, I got a weird feeling and just got really uneasy and sick. It could have been a dream, but it was so creepy that it still freaks me out to this day. So I was going to my sister's graduation at Binghamton University, and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights, the only one that had five bedrooms, because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian-era house, completely decked out with Victorian-American aesthetics. Trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people, ornate flower wallpaper, and dolls. Many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms, and no one in the family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious, and I didn't see the room, and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation. So I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them because you're something they've likely never encountered before silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony-handled Openel pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp, and went under the covers. I felt the dolls staring, but my rational side told me that it was all in my head. By 3 a.m. I was half conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay. I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony-handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered, statistically, Armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed to death. It was at that moment that I heard vividly in a playful childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode alert. Adrenaline rushed through me, I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night, I thought, you know what? 
Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept through the night. So for slight context, I'm 22. And as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, my mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down it apparently played for about five minutes, abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think. My family used to go camping with a few group of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas when I was about five, we were camping out in the bush. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the bush if we wanted to. The parents would give us a walkie talkie to tell us when to come back to camp and we never wandered far. Anyway, out of nowhere, an unfamiliar voice came over the walkies. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents and asked us to look for him. We all ran back to our campsite, excited to tell everybody that we had talked to Santa. The walkie talkie was taken off of us and we weren't allowed to go anywhere for the rest of the trip. At the time, as kids, we were pretty devastated. But now, as an adult, I understand the seriousness and the creepiness of it. And I'm really glad that we didn't go looking for him. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the US Army. We lived off base in private housing and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring, fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or ten-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement, just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. 
Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear, I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser. But they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool. And it's an experience that I will never forget. In Sydney, there's this National Park Drive where people complete runs which consist of trying to complete the drives within a timestamp. I've been doing these so-called Nasho runs for a while now with my best friend. Nothing has ever happened before, and the drive through the park is spooky at night, sure, but I've always found comfort in the woodlands or in night drives, so I never really thought anything of it. A few nights ago, Three of my friends and I went for a Nasho run, and exactly at the halfway point, we hit a pothole pretty hard, which resulted in a flat tire, so we pulled over to the side on a long road. This place has no reception, and it's in the middle of nowhere, with no way of walking through or back. We had a spare tire, but no change kit, so I had one friend on call for help which was a pain due to the lack of reception. My best friend panics a lot, so she was on the verge of crying, and I was rummaging through the boot for a wrench and a jack. About 20 meters away was a parked car, which was strange because the last house we passed was about a kilometer away, but we just shrugged it off. Later on in the dead of night, we hear a group of friends laughing, and this spooked my friends so they stayed in the car. I told them I was going to follow the laughter and ask if they had a change kit in their parked car. Nate insisted on coming with me. We walked 20 meters to the parked car and nobody was in there. It gets pretty freaking dark, so I tell him to turn on his flashlight, which he does. We turn a corner on a gravel road and once we do, we see a woman standing there with her back toward us. The group laughter had stopped, which left us in the dead of night, in complete silence, in the middle of nowhere, with this random woman who was just standing there. But she looked pretty normal to me, so I approached her slowly. I said, hey. She didn't turn around, or react at all. So I stopped in my tracks, but Nate continued walking toward her. He stopped about five meters away behind her. I yelled out, Oi! And again, she didn't turn around. We weren't able to see her face, but something just wasn't right. She was tall, in all white, but I looked at Nate and he just stood there, and under his breath, he muttered my name and told me to go repeatedly. So I turned around and started walking back. By the time we passed the car, we started running back to our car. We sat inside and I asked what happened and he said that something was wrong because a woman just shouldn't be standing there by herself in pitch darkness in the middle of a gravel road. In addition to that, she didn't react to us or our source of light. He said he just felt ominous about it all. We told our other two friends and Nate was very shaken up. They sort of laughed it off. And when we ended up finally changing the tire, we turned the car back around and stopped right where we had seen the woman. I rolled the window down and shined my flashlight on the gravel road. The woman was gone though. No more laughter, just silence. 
I thought maybe I had imagined her, but we stood right there, and Nate was right behind her. However, every single one of us heard the group laughter, and there's a fair share of paranormal stories about this area. But up until then, I'd never really paid attention to it. I know it doesn't sound like much, but at the time, it was so crazy. Something just felt so, so wrong. And the way the laughter got relatively loud the closer we got but then came to a total halt once we saw her, something was just wrong. It was somewhere in the middle of the White Mountains in the summer when I walked into what looked like a scene from a horror movie. A person with zero hiking, camping, or other experience had gotten themselves into trouble. Big trouble. It was around 7 a.m. when I found the campsite. The first thing that hit me was the eerie stillness until I noticed the shredded tent under a tree and the desperate looking human figure covered in blood, whimpering quietly. I put my bag down, grabbed my kit, and went over to the person. They looked like they had just lost a knife fight with a four-armed man. Deep slashes from one shoulder to the hip, single punctures up and down his back, and hands and forearms full of what looked to be defensive cuts. I patched him up the best I could, gave him water, checked my map, and hightailed it to the closest road. This was before cell phones were super prevalent and barely worked in the mountains. Thankfully, the road was very close by, less than two miles, and I was able to flag somebody down. They took off and I waited for assistance to arrive. It took about an hour until rescue got there. I led them to the still unidentified individual. He wasn't very conversive when I first found him. I was sure he'd be dead before we got there, but I was wrong. I assisted rescue bringing him out and took them up on their offer to head into town and get cleaned up. After cleaning up and getting myself situated at their station, I went on my way, leaving them my number to call to let me know what was up with the person that we had helped. I got home three days later, and there was a message on my machine. Story goes that the guy I found decided to go camping one day and heard that he had to keep food hung from a tree to keep bears away. Well, he did that, but he put it almost directly over his tent, and not high enough. The night before I happened upon the site, a bear had used the tent, and its occupant, in an attempt to climb the tree to get the food. The guy had woken up to four black bear paws sinking into his body, shifting to reach up. The guy survived and swore to the hospital staff that he was moving to the city and never going into the woods again. I went for a casual night walk in the woods with my friend. We were walking along the path, along the river, and talking. Then we decided to stop for a while and sit on a bench that was right there next to the path facing the forest. The river was flowing behind us. We were sitting there for quite a while, just talking about random things. I suddenly started to hear a soft tinkling, like a small bell ringing, almost like a bicycle bell or a dog's leash, every now and then. I didn't pay much attention to it at first, but it kept getting closer and more frequent. So I told my friend about it. He confirmed that he could hear it too, so I started to listen a bit more closely. I looked in the direction that it was coming from, expecting to see somebody riding a bicycle or walking a dog at any second. That wouldn't be too unusual, as we used to go there quite often, and even in the middle of the night, we would come across a few people going on a walk with their dog. The moon was shining brightly, so I could see a silhouette if there was a person coming toward us, but I could only hear the ringing, getting closer and more frequent. Out of nowhere, my gut told me that we should leave, so I told my friend and we started to walk away. I walked a little faster than usual, as I was a bit creeped out already, and after a while of not hearing a thing, 
it suddenly ringed about two meters away from us. We both just started running. We could hear it ring close behind us a few more times, and then it suddenly stopped. We could hear that we were getting away from it. When we got back to the city, we talked about it, and we realized we both heard it from different sides. I had clearly heard it coming from the left, but he heard it coming from the right. So how did we hear it coming from different directions? Only when it got close to us, and we started running, could we hear it coming from the same place. The worst thing about it all is that both of us could hear it, so it couldn't be my imagination. That and I got that weird gut feeling of danger that I've never experienced before or since. I've lived in rural Massachusetts for 17 years of my life, and I've encountered a lot of wildlife in my time here. One day I was moving my mare up toward another pasture, which was a little ways down from my house, a good 15 minute walk. I tacked her up and we were making our way down the main road. The road is still very rural, dense forest lies on either side, and cars rarely drive on it. It's a perfect main road to horseback ride on. All of a sudden, my mare wouldn't keep going. Annoyed, I dismounted and decided to lead her on foot to the pasture. We were making our way around a corner when I noticed my mare's gaze fixated on something. Less than 15 feet away from us was a large black bear. As we made eye contact, my heart sank into my stomach. I was 16 years old at the time and barely weighed 100 pounds. Staring down something so large is unforgettable, and it was one of the scariest things I've ever experienced. Not only do I have this thing's attention, but I have a whole damn horse with me, and I'm on the ground, not even on the horse. Maybe I didn't act the way I was supposed to, but I'm alive, so I'm not complaining. I slowly started walking backwards with my mare, not wanting to risk anything. Adrenaline does weird things. After I re-rounded the corner and the bear was out of sight, I mounted my mare and made my way back to my house. I actually drove up with my car and managed to get a few blurry pictures of it, but nothing to write home about. I have had a lot of weird ass borderline paranormal encounters in the woods, but nothing beats mother nature's creatures. This is one of the many things that I have never told to anyone before, because I'm pretty sure that nobody would have believed me, thinking that my imagination was just wild, and sometimes I still doubt that anybody will believe me. But I remember this happening for real, so I wanted to share. This thing happened to me in the past when I was around nine, and I always used to hang out with my oldest cousin, who was seven back then. We were pretty inseparable at the time, before everything changed when he turned 18. I was spending the night at my granny's house, as I used to be her personal dog sitter, and he decided to come hang out with me. He suggested that it was a good idea to go into the nearest forest, which was almost right next to her house. We were living in a medium-sized city, but the forest is almost always near buildings at some parts or areas. Around 10 or 11 p.m., we decided just to walk to the edge of the forest, since it would have been completely foolish to go deep into the forest that late. I told him that that would be a good idea, since we were both kind of bored and feeling adventurous. We headed out and just started to walk toward the edge of the forest, both up for having a small adventure. But that didn't even last a half hour before the weird things started to happen. I remember when I was standing against a big tree and looking just in front of me, my cousin was near my side, like six or seven inches away from me. I was looking in front of me and I felt like I was searching for something. I'm still unclear of what exactly it was, but I was just looking. 
All of a sudden, I saw red eyes staring at me from out of nowhere, but they were really far from us. I turned toward my cousin and asked if he was seeing what I was, but he ignored my question. So I turned back to look at the eyes and they were much closer than before. I blinked a few times, but of course I couldn't see anything around them and they weren't getting closer. I just saw trees. I turned back to him and asked the same question, but he kept ignoring me. So I turned one last time to look at them, to see that they were even closer and closer. I just kept watching them, feeling a little bit afraid at this moment. And I swear that they started to come toward me, even when I didn't look away. So I just grabbed his hand and ran as quickly as I could until we saw the street lamps. After that, I've never seen or experienced the same thing ever again. The weirdest thing in hindsight is that I never heard it getting closer. I never heard anything at all. Even if it had been like a wolf or a dog or something like that, I would have heard rustling or branches or something. But there was just nothing. It's been 16 years since this happened and it has always stayed with me. A couple of years ago, my pops and I decided to go on a road trip. It was very out of the blue. I wasn't even expecting it, but I decided to go anyway. It would be some solid father-son bonding time. After driving for what seemed like a couple of hours, it was maybe around 8 to 9 p.m., we pulled up into this gas station for snacks and water and to use the bathroom. And we went back inside our car. Keep in mind, this gas station was basically in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we got back into our car and decided to look for a motel, but there were none. And I mean, there wasn't a single one anywhere near us. My dad was really tired, so we decided to sleep in the car. We pulled up into this sort of resting area slash parking lot and decided to go to sleep. My dad fell fast asleep, but I was on my phone for a couple of hours and around 11 p.m., I just felt suffocated by the tense air and I decided to step out for a bit. I felt safe because the gas station was still in sight and there would be a couple of trucks that would occasionally drive by, so I felt at ease. At this time, I was also texting my friend who lives in Seattle, Washington, and we were on the phone for a bit. Then I saw what looked like a large cornfield. I was a city guy, so I'd never seen a cornfield in real life. So I decided to cross the road and just get a closer look. So that's what I did. I walked extremely close and started feeling like I was being watched. But again, I thought, well, you're literally outside in the dark standing next to a tall cornfield. Of course, you're going to feel weird. So I brushed it off. I even considered going in, but then I thought, why would I even do that? So anyway, I decided to just take a step back when I noticed a barn, a large white barn with red, maybe black strips. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it surely was a barn. And I was stupid and young when this happened, maybe 14 or 15. So out of curiosity, I decided to just check it out. The barn was next to the cornfield, kind of tucked in a little. I literally thought to myself, I wish I could see something that would freak me out as a joke because I never really thought that anything would happen and I love being scared. Anyway, I started making my way toward the barn. Getting closer and closer, I remember very vividly that I was wearing no socks and just slip on slides. I remember the dirt rubbing against my toes while I walked. I remember sending pictures to my friend in Washington jokingly saying that I saw something and I was going to go check it out. As I got closer, I did see something. Behind the barn, but sort of to the side. Like how when someone peers from a corner. At first, I thought it was a bell. Literally, I assumed that it was just a bell attached to the corner of the barn. So I just walked closer. I kept moving toward it. And then I saw the head of something or someone just peering around the corner at me. 
At that moment, I straight up froze. My flight or fight was out of function, apparently, because there I was, literally seeing someone or something peering at the corner, and I didn't do either of those things. After about five to 10 seconds, the noise that Snapchat makes when you get a notification snapped me out of it. And I just ran as fast as I could across the road to my dad's car and got in. I felt a sense of relief wash over my body. And somehow, my dad was not awake. Me gasping for air wasn't enough to stir him from his sleep, I guess. I really considered waking him up and telling him that we have to leave and telling him what I saw. But he would assume that I was joking or having some kind of episode since he's never believed in anything paranormal or out of the ordinary at all. I took deep breaths and just texted my friend telling her what I saw, but she didn't believe me. I don't blame her, and I won't blame any of you either if you don't believe me. I have a hard time actually believing what I saw sometimes, but I know it was real. I was sober and fully aware, but from the bottom of my heart, the part that disturbs me the most is that whatever was peering at me from around that corner was very tall at least seven, maybe eight feet tall. And every time I think about that, I get a sense of dread and paranoia. I haven't told any of my family, not even my dad, but if any of you have a clue of what I might've seen, let me know. I wasn't hallucinating. And this was way before I figured out anything to do with psychedelics or drugs in general. I've been trying to piece it together ever since it happened. I was sort of 50-50 on paranormal encounters before, but after that experience, I believe. I believe in walkers and wendigos and ghosts and everything pretty much. It's completely changed me. I wanna know what's out there. I want to know what I encountered. I was on patrol one night in my town, and we were told to go to some weird place that none of us had ever heard of. Cernan Lake is how it's pronounced. I haven't been able to find it on any maps after the fact, and we had to be directed by dispatch to a back road, which was barely visible from the highway. Grass had grown over most of it, and you could only see tiny gravel rocks here and there. We're no strangers to small towns out in the middle of nowhere, seeing as there's a ghetto calling itself Lake Annette nearby. Anyway, someone had reported a woman screaming inside of a motel, and two men had gone into the room and not come out. Naturally, this sounds like a pretty big deal. So we're sent out there and being guided over radio by dispatch. When we get there, it's basically just a set of eight buildings, one of which is a gas station. There were no pumps, and it was basically just a house with a concrete drive-in. The motel is the closest thing to the road. A bunch of people, maybe about nine, were standing outside the motel. Most of the lights inside were on, and at first we didn't hear any screaming. We tried briefly to talk to the people outside about what was going on, but everyone said something along the lines of, I don't know, I just woke up because of all the screaming. Seeing as this was a potentially dangerous situation, I drew my taser, and my partner drew his service pistol in case the taser didn't work for whatever reason. Thick clothing, probe going off too far to one side, something like that. As soon as we open the front door to the motel, the screaming starts up again. It was incredibly painful to the ears and caused us to run to the room from which it was coming. We yelled in that we were the police and we went in. As soon as the door is open, the screaming stops, just gone. The room looks completely ransacked, scratches on the walls. No blood though, nothing seems to be missing, just misplaced or damaged. The bathroom was completely clean, no scratches. Closets were empty. We looked under the beds even, and nothing was there. We poked around for as long as we felt was necessary and radioed in that we didn't find anything. We waited for other people to come out and help. We left and went back to the station and wrote up written reports. 
We still have absolutely no idea what happened. Investigators don't have any idea. And we haven't heard anything from the lake town since. I've been having sleep paralysis fairly frequently, hearing scratching on the walls and footsteps, as well as nightmares. None of this happened until we went there. I've been working with a psychiatrist to deal with it, currently trying Ambien to see if it'll keep me from experiencing sleep paralysis. I've been tempted to go out there again on my own time, but I haven't been able to work up the nerve. Our department can't afford body cams for everybody since we're a small town department. We can barely afford repairs on our vehicles, so we didn't get any footage. I have no idea what this might have been. I'm leaning towards some kind of elaborate prank, but it just seems odd. Like it would have taken way too much effort to actually fake it to be worth it. We've seen the guy who owns the so-called gas station coming to our gas stations and filling up gas cans. He puts them in the back of his pickup and drives back toward the highway with him. I also asked around as the post office said that they do occasionally get mail to and from there, but it's mostly tax stuff. I haven't been able to find it on any maps. The view is blocked by trees on Google Earth, and you can't really see the turnoff on the highway. I've been having trouble finding really any official records related to it, aside from a case file from the early 90s, before I was even born, about a textbook domestic disturbance. I guess this story is a little boring, but it just happened to me, so here you go. I was rock climbing with two other guys in Colorado and was belaying one of them when the two of us on the ground heard something weird. The commands we use to communicate that we are safe at the top of a route are, name the guy on the ground, off belay, which prompts the belayer to unclip the rope from his belay device so the climber can pull slack out of the rope. The response to that command is, name of the guy at the top of the route, belay off. The climber was approximately 40 meters up on an about 50 meter route. I didn't know this at the time. The rope stopped moving, which isn't uncommon when someone is having a hard time with a move or is setting up an anchor, which is what we thought was going on. But then we heard it. A voice that sounded way closer to the ground like close enough that we could have had a shouting conversation and way farther left off route of where the climber should have been, said, my name, off belay. I looked at the other guy in our climbing party who was just as confused as I was. He said to me, what the F was that? And we discussed where the climber should be at this time and that we shouldn't be able to hear him that well. The rope still wasn't moving but I decided to keep him on belay. I figured it would be best to keep him safe and just feed slack through my belay device in the event that it wasn't him. Turns out it wasn't. A few moments later, the rope starts moving again, later followed by a faint syllable counted, my name off belay, that sounded way more like it should have. We didn't really think anything of it, but we had been traveling down the wall and hit a few routes without seeing anyone. We also had a friend just a few months ago that got burned in on a route when someone took him off belay when he wasn't safe. I remember seeing a video of a hiker or rancher or something walking down the road when he hears the voice of a woman calling him off the road. The guy stops to figure out what's going on, then just gets out of there because of how weird it was. I'm starting to wonder if there's a cryptid that can mimic the voice of a certain person. We're not entirely sure what happened, but we know two things. Number one, it's a really good idea that I didn't listen to that first voice. And second, it wasn't a person.
About three years ago, I was on a family vacation to eastern Washington, and a central aspect of our trip was visiting Lake Paragon State Park. It's an extremely rural area with a tiny western town about a mile away, and that's about it for miles. Anyway, we had just arrived for our 10-day stay in the afternoon, and it was now around 11 p.m. My mom and I left our hotel to go down to the park, as she was really into photography and the moon was full. If you're not familiar, eastern Washington as a whole is pretty desolate, so the night sky is generally incredible with very little light pollution. There were no clouds to be seen, and we were a ways down a dirt back road over the park, above the campground, with no real roads anywhere in sight. We got out of the car and took some pictures, with nothing more unusual than the eerie silence. About 15 minutes into our visit, we're both facing away from the moon, looking at the rolling hills, and we noticed this odd concentration of light on one hillside, about a quarter mile away. Before either one of us could point it out to the other, the mass of light shining on this hill rolled away into nowhere. It took two seconds and was entirely gone. The whole hillside was brightly lit up, and then… nothing. We freaked out and got out of there as fast as humanly possible. We both saw it. There were no other people, no moving clouds, and no roads from which headlights could shine. We still have no explanation for what we witnessed. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty. No other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then, a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute. But we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So, we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm, and they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this, but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car, and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently, people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker, though. 
I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not necessarily religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana, and she grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful, typical, boring, old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn shut and would always peek out the window. And whenever somebody would ask her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yenoglushi is watching me. This went on for nearly the entire visit until a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother, he's 19 now, we're in the front yard that evening planting flowers when all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting, get away from that creature, it's not safe, to my brother. Of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake, so we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard, was a large, black, Great Dane-sized dog. It was staring at my grandmother with an intensity that I have never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a little huff, and bounded off. I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember that it had very deep yellow eyes. When my mother asked my grandmother what had happened, she kept repeating, the Yenoglushi has found me. She moved a couple of weeks after that. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail 
was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted, 
It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped. And then, the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. I 
live in a super rural area and walk my dog outside in the dark every night. Tonight, I was walking her later than usual, and things felt very off. First, we went outside and I walked no more than two feet away from the door and felt something wet under my foot. I checked my shoes and there was a slug in the middle of my shoe. It didn't look like a normal slug, but I don't know what else to call it. I have no clue how it got there because I know it wasn't there when I put them on. As I'm trying to figure out what the hell is in my shoes, my dog starts freaking out and growling at the house across the street. She does this somewhat commonly because they have dogs that attacked her once. So I didn't think much of it and went inside to get another pair of shoes. I walked back outside and was immediately struck with the feeling that something was wrong. The first time I was out, I heard weird, quiet music, but just thought that the neighbors were playing something. This time, the music was gone, but there was this incessant, high-pitched shriek periodically. My dog and I literally stopped, just stopped, and stood for like a minute, listening. There was this periodic shriek, and then another sound, like a high-pitched bark, Definitely not a fox, I know that sound, and none of the dogs in the area bark like that. The sound would happen every now and again. The worst part was that everything else was dead silent. If you live in the country, you know that it's never silent, not even in the winter. I took a recording on my phone of the noises, but they weren't super loud and it didn't pick them up very well. So I'm feeling a little weird, but I get scared easily, so I try to brush it off and let my dog go to the bathroom. As soon as I stop the recording, my dog starts flipping out, hackles raised, growling, barking, and jumping at something behind us in the yard. She didn't have to tell me twice, so we ran to the door and inside the house. I shut the door behind us and immediately felt relief. I felt like I was being chased, trying to get to the door. My dog ran around the house and did a check out of the windows to make sure everything was clear, I guess, and then went to bed. I don't know what happened, but it scared the crap out of me. I'm hoping that I'm just being paranoid. When I was younger, around 18, I was visiting my aunt in Albuquerque. She lived at a little B&B that had a big field behind it at the time. The second night I was there, I couldn't sleep. Around midnight, this bizarre howl or scream or cry started up. It was really loud, even inside the house. Her cats seemed to be alerted as well. So I woke my aunt up. She said that she had never heard that in 10 years of living there. Bear in mind, she's an insomniac, so she's often up very late. When the sound kept going, she started toward the door to go see what it was. But I was like, I don't think so. So we stayed in. The sound continued until around sunrise. The owner of the B&B was out of town at the time, but when asked, she said that she had never heard a sound like that either. We asked some of her friends who said that they had heard that somebody was going around playing sounds on a loop, trying to lure people out of the house. That's really the only lead I have. I went out into the field the next day and I didn't see anything weird. Maybe it was just someone messing with people, trying to lure them out for some nefarious reason. Or maybe it was a cryptid. Either way, it was pretty creepy. When I was young, I attended the local scout group based in my village in Hampshire. The amount of things that I learned from scouts and the lessons that it taught me are innumerable, but one particular memory stands out. 
Once on a camp at an old scouting campsite, I remember we were playing a game at night, which was World War II themed. Our leader loved creating military themed games. In this game, each team had a bomb, a colored string of wool, that they had to fix to the enemy base, which was a random piece of rope that was put up in the woods, making sure not to get caught by the enemy soldiers, which were the leaders carrying flashlights. As somewhat of a tactician, I departed from the other scouts, who were heading straight down the main path toward the enemy base, and also toward the leaders. Instead, opting to flank around deep into the woods, which took longer, but proved to be more successful in the dark. Eventually, deep in the woods and on my way to another bombing run, I heard the distant sound of the whistle. This signaled that the game was over and that everyone should return to the camp. I began making a leisurely stroll back through the darkness. I can't remember if I was alerted by sight or by sound, but my attention was drawn to a short silhouette walking through the woods about six to eight meters away. Assuming that this was one of the younger scouts who was also returning to camp, I decided that it would be funny to try and scare them by making growling noises. Immediately after making the noises, the silhouette stopped dead in its tracks, turning toward me. In the darkness, I couldn't make out any of their clothes or features, but I could clearly see the blacked out silhouette of a child. After the figure had clearly noticed me but not made a sound, I decided to carry on making growling noises. But then the silhouette just turned around and began to walk away from me. They were clearly unfazed by my attempt to scare them, so I figured that I would just follow them back to camp. However, after a few steps, the figure literally face planted into the ground, still about eight meters in front. I jogged a bit to catch up with them and make sure they were okay, but upon reaching where they were, there was no trace of anyone. Confused, I looked around for a short while, seeing if they had scrambled off, but there was no noise of someone running away, and I didn't notice them get up. They had just vanished. Still in a state of confusion, I continued to walk back to the camp alone. I didn't really tell anyone until years later when it clicked in my brain that things just didn't add up. Something else that sticks in my memory from that camp, which is probably unrelated but still strange, was that part of the woods had been cut down and the grounds heavily churned up by some sort of heavy duty machine. Whilst exploring this area, some of my friends and I found an old leather briefcase that looked like it had been churned up by whatever machine had been in the area. Upon opening the briefcase, we found a really old scouting uniform, think sand colored and military style with shoulder lapels, with quite a few loose badges and some other personal items that I can't remember. I don't know if it was related to the boy or not, but it's still kind of strange. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers, so it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. 
Anyway, I hit the side of my head and I pressed my ear and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway, I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left and he said he'd been up all night throwing up completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. My hometown is small and remote and we had a Native American reservation a few minutes outside of town. I was close to a lot of the people that lived there, mostly the teenagers and children, as they shared extracurricular activities through the school, so I grew pretty accustomed to their beliefs. Now, I moved pretty far away right before I started high school, but I visited somewhat frequently, as I still had family there. My grandmother owned a camp on a small lake, it was very quaint and nice to spend time there. However, as soon as it became dark out, things felt very different. On one side, we had neighbors for miles. On the other, it was dense woods. My cousins and I, one a year older and one a year younger, had always found those woods creepy. We visited now and then, but always became very uncomfortable and soon left. One night, I was traveling back home, down south with my cousins and my aunt. These were very remote lake roads, inhabited by very, very few. Dense woods bordered both sides, so, naturally, some nocturnal animals were out. But one that we saw was very different. It wasn't as big as I typically see these creatures described, but it wasn't small either. Maybe the size of a large coyote, or a small wolf, and we don't live in wolf country, by the way. But it didn't look like either of those. It was crouched back on its hind legs, just kind of chilling out. As we drove past, it turned its head to look at us. It had a pretty blank face, almost like an owl's, but without the beak, and a bear's muzzle instead. Its body looked like a poor rendition of a human, like if you asked someone to draw a person but they had never seen one before. Its legs bent the wrong way, like a horse almost. It had toes like an alpaca. Its arms were very long. And frankly, it was the most human thing about it. It had very patchy, wiry, matted fur. Now, I know it wasn't an animal with mange. I've seen many animals with mange. And yes, it's scary but it was nothing like this thing. It didn't necessarily chase us, but it trotted behind us for a while. Everybody was freaking out, naturally. But I think deep down, 
I knew. Can I get any confirmation or information about what this might have been? And if so, are there any precautions I should take to keep this thing away? It happened years ago, but I'm still lost. I was sitting downstairs in the kitchen, waiting for water to boil. I was talking to my brother downstairs for a bit, and he told me that he was going to take a shower. Soon after, my brother went upstairs to go shower. I was alone by myself downstairs, sitting on a chair, playing on my phone, and facing myself toward the opened bathroom. My phone was positioned upward near my face. It's not sitting so low near the bottom. About two minutes later, out of the top of my peripheral vision, I saw my brother walking out of the bathroom, wearing clothes that I have seen him own and wear before. The top half of the shirt is white while the bottom half is black. His head was positioned and focused oddly when he was walking out of the bathroom, like straight forward. He wasn't looking at me. I felt kind of startled, so I stood up and called out to him. No one else appeared in the living room, at that moment, I remembered that my brother was upstairs in the other bathroom showering. One thing I remember is that he walked out fast, but didn't seem to completely walk all the way out. It was like he was diminished halfway through. That part freaked me out the most. It was my brother that I saw, but something was just not quite right. I've never seen a doppelganger before, and it really freaked me out. About four years ago, we had to live with my mom's friend for a while. The day we came to her house, we were moving things in and I went out to get some of the last things in the car. When I went outside, sitting in the car, clutching the steering wheel, was my mom's friend, staring at me, wearing a red dress with her hair down. I knew it wasn't her because I had just seen her 10 seconds earlier in the house with her hair up in a bun and she was wearing a light pink sweater with white pants. I ran back inside and found my mom and her friend talking in the kitchen. I told them what I had seen. We looked out of the window of the living room where the car could be seen from and nobody was there. None of us left the house for the rest of the night. We finished getting the stuff out of the car the next day. That was not the last paranormal thing that happened to us in that house. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different, but to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. Everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, so I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore, so I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car. No dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could, 
and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, Yoo-hoo! And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky, because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard, so I stepped back, and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him, and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute, and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in, and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. This happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird, and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced, or who or what I had seen, so I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it. So a few weeks back, my neighbor was over talking and just shooting the breeze, hanging out and whatnot. My other neighbor called me, and when I went to answer, my phone randomly died. I told my neighbor, phone's dead, I'll throw it on the charger and head out. When I put my phone on the charger, I waited for the screen to tell me what percent the battery was. It stayed black, as if the battery was completely drained. I waited about 20 seconds and it finally lit up, confirming a 5% charge. I was headed back to the living room when I thought I heard my buddy in the bathroom. I noticed that the light was off and it sounded as if he was in there trying to play a prank on me, scare me or something like that. So I tried to walk in and scare him, but it felt like I was being stopped at some sort of invisible force field. I tried my hand and it just went numb like a dead arm. The harder I tried to get into that bathroom, the more drained and the weaker I felt. I tried to force my way in. The door was completely open and it was pitch black inside. It was about 10.30 at night. I tried with some decent effort and it just felt as if something was grabbing me from the center of my chest, pulling me back and away from the bathroom. I imagined like somebody had a hold of my sternum and forcefully pulled me out of the bathroom and back into the hallway on the floor. I physically collapsed as if I had just run a marathon, absolutely drained and with no energy. 
I finally got my energy to stand back up and get to the door. My buddy says, that was quick. Hey, uh, what's wrong? I walked to the couch and sat down. I told him that I thought I had hurt him in the bathroom and I collapsed when I tried to walk in. He told me that I had walked out of the back hallway and told him, I'm going to be right back. I forgot that I wanted to put some cologne on. I have no memory of this. Was that some spirit or entity that took over me? Did my doppelganger come and visit and take over my life for a second? I was completely sober and I was halfway through one beer when my phone died. So I have no idea what happened. This happened a long time ago. My family and I love going to garage sales and thrift stores. My parents are very friendly and polite and people usually like them pretty quickly. So they've been offered several times to take stuff for free and they've even gotten these types of deals. You can have everything for free, but you have to take all the stuff. So we've ended up with a truck filled with random garage sale items more than once. One time, my mom and I were in her bedroom, checking the loot of one of these types of deals. We were having a good time while sorting all of the stuff. We got to this big trash bag that was filled with dolls. There were lots of them. So I decided to just open the entire bag and put them all out on the bed. We started checking the dolls one by one, choosing which ones to keep for my sister and which ones we should give away and which ones we should throw away. Most of these deals include taking some trash, but we didn't care, it was fun. We have half the bag sorted out. When we get to this tumbling doll that supposedly can do flips, my mom likes it. Looks like new and seems like a fun toy for my sister, so she wants to keep it. She asks me to test it to see the doll tumbling but the batteries seem to be dead. Tried again with brand new batteries, but still no luck. After a few minutes, I concluded that the doll must be broken and that it didn't work. So I take out the batteries and place the old dead ones back in. I put the doll back on the bed and we keep sorting the items. 15 minutes pass and my mom and I were just taking a break chatting when suddenly we hear this loud noise that sounded like gears and an overcharged motor. We looked at the bed and the sound comes from the doll, the tumbling one. And right in front of both of us, this doll turns its head, looks at me and says, Mama. The movement was so abrupt that I even felt the bed shake a little. My mom and I looked at each other and I saw her face turn ash white. I just punched the doll as hard as I could as a reflex and it landed on the other side of the bedroom. We immediately went to the kitchen to calm down and explain what just happened to my dad. After a few minutes, I go back to the room with my dad to investigate, trying to figure out what had just happened. My mom enters in full rage mode and goes for the doll and puts it in a plastic bag and asks my dad to take it out to the trash out of the house, now. My parents are religious, so after that, they prayed and blessed the entire house for almost an hour. I've never seen my mom that scared. It truly felt like a scene from a horror movie. I expected the doll to get up and attack me in that moment. I don't really believe in the paranormal, even though I have had a couple of experiences that scared me that I can't explain. Growing up, I always hated dolls and was scared of them even to the point of having really messed up nightmares about them. Good thing this happened when I was older, around 16, or I'd probably still be traumatized. What still bugs me is that even if I do find some rational explanation for why the doll worked again with dead batteries, with the power switch off and not being touched by anything, the doll wasn't a baby doll. It was a gymnastics doll that was supposed to do flips as it wasn't new and there was no box, 
I'll probably never know if saying mama was one of its features. And honestly, I'm okay never knowing. I've always loved the paranormal, even as a little girl. I grew up with horror movies and find the paranormal fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past that I'll probably tell about later, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience I ever had. I don't have any photos or anything because this happened when I was in the third grade in 2003 and I didn't have anything to record with, or even to take pictures with at the time. Anyway, I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom, and my grandmother was in the room. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, on my bookshelf where all my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see one of the doll's dresses billowing around her, and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks on me. I should mention that my mom had rearranged them that day and had them all facing in the same direction. Skip to the next day. I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something. And I walked back in and all of my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of there screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again, but my room had always been off and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later. And this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls and they would go off randomly sometimes. I started to feel like I was being watched and that I wasn't alone, but I brushed it off as paranoia because I never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college after years of dealing with minimal doll movement, something changed. I was in my room one night and I felt something breathe down my neck. It scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night anymore. My parents divorced when I was 15 and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was a medium. I asked her if, whenever she came over, she would check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped into my room, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because the family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-sized, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that that was the one she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls, and I don't feel anything in my room anymore. I still constantly check my bookshelf, though, just to make sure everything's all right. And it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls. But still, I don't think I'll ever forget. A while back, Rando Nautica directed me and some friends of mine to some scary woods. I obviously had a lot of interesting findings over the last few days, but today was definitely significant. Along the same scary woods path that Rando Nautica had led us to, some friends and I were showing it off to another friend. We happened to find a random clearing in the forest with some path just along the road. I was driving, so I stayed lookout at the car while two of my friends went in with flashlights. It was around 9 p.m. When they went in, everything seemed normal until they looked up and saw tons of different dolls hanging above in the trees. I heard my first friend scream and run out of there. My second friend started recording and got it on camera before he also ran out. They told me that there were even more dolls that they didn't notice going in 
and the ones near the exit of the clearing were even creepier, having large eyes and, for some, disconnected eyes. None of us have any idea what this could be. Something cursed, some kind of ritual. We don't really know, but it was definitely freaky. My church had a fish fry in the seventh grade. I had decided not to go, but to host friends after. I was playing video games when they walked into my house. I noticed that one of them had a strange all black doll in their hands. Obviously, I inquired, and they told me that they had found a voodoo doll. Later, I would learn that the creepy kid at school had thrown it at them. None of us bought it, so naturally, we started putting our hair in it. After messing around with it to no avail, we left it on the floor and turned on a movie. Later on, another friend joined us, and not seeing the doll, he kicked it clear across the room. We paid it no mind at first, but seconds later my friend starts to cry as blood comes pouring out of his nose. Freaked out, we run out of the basement and try to move on with the night. For the next couple of nights, my friends and I experienced weird events. The main two people who messed with it got the worst. The number one culprit had footsteps walking all around his room, and his door would open during the night. Along with the footsteps and doors, he would hear masculine voices outside of his door. His parents were lesbians, so it wasn't either of them, as they both had fairly feminine and higher-pitched voices. The second culprit was awoken three nights in a row with bloody noses. Personally, I just had very vivid dreams of family members being killed and horrifying images. Not much has happened since, and I don't really talk to those guys anymore as we kind of all went on our separate paths. I still am not entirely sure what we experienced or how it all happened, but I'll never mess with one of those things again. I just got this beautiful antique baby doll from Etsy. Something about her really caught my attention, and I just had to have her. I do collect antique dolls and trinkets, but I knew since day one that this one was different. I have used two different kinds of EMF meters on her throughout the day, and I have received various intelligent responses, both with the EMF and with the spirit box and combined. She doesn't have any batteries of any sort in her that could give off a faulty reading. I have had my phone in a different room with the lights off while conducting multiple tests with the EMF, and I ensured that she wasn't anywhere near walls or light switches. I'm looking for a logical explanation here. If I can't find one, I may just assume that this doll truly does have a paranormal attachment. As a really small child, I used to be terrified of a doll that my grandmother had that had been handmade for my mother when she was younger. I had repetitive nightmares where this thing would come to visit me for most of my childhood and even occasionally as a teenager and adult. The last time that I was around it physically was shortly after my grandmother died and I still felt uneasy looking directly at it even at 25 years old. My mom sold it during an estate sale to a woman in the town where my grandmother died, and it's lost as far as I know. I had always written off this phobia as some weird, irrational childhood fear, because Raggedy Ann dolls are creepy as hell looking, especially when they're homemade, and I just assumed that it was normal. But the hold this doll had on me 
that made me feel as if it was staring into the depths of my soul constantly, I just couldn't shake. Then something crazy happened. And after doing some research, I discovered that the real life version of the Annabelle doll matched the Raggedy Ann version my grandmother had almost perfectly. I know most of this is just a coincidence, but I have always felt that something was off about this doll. It harbored bad energy. Oddly enough, after all of this, I have inquired about the doll to my mother because I feel like I have this weird connection to it. She told me that she never kept it in the house around me when I was younger because I always cried and became hysterical at night when it was around, so she gave it to my grandmother. I'm just imagining me finding this thing and then driving it home in the middle of the night and crazy things start happening. For the record, I do not believe in ghosts or spirits, but I will go to my grave saying that I picked up on something evil from this doll as a kid. I really wish I had a picture to share, but I honestly avoided this thing as much as possible and always felt that it was looking at me from around the corner at night. I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this as a kid, where you just knew something wasn't right. It probably sounds dumb, but I honestly believe that something was going on, and my younger self picked up on it. The summer before last, my boyfriend and I took a road trip to Omaha, Nebraska, with the main purpose being to visit the Museum of Shadows. We're both somewhere between believer and skeptic and thought that it would be a great experience for us. Leaning in, he even paid the $20 to rent a spirit box to use as we walked around the museum. If you haven't visited the Museum of Shadows, I'd recommend it, even if only because I found it very cathartic. It's mostly dolls with tragic stories attached to them, but walking around reading all the stories of suffering and sadness that families associated with many of these items was very heart opening for lack of a better word. Some items I felt were just creepy and that's where people's associations of hauntings came from when they owned them. I believe sometimes people create their own hauntings by just simply being afraid of an object same with the dolls owned by children who had passed. The families are just so saddened and grief-stricken that they begin to assign their child's spirit to those items. It's so sad, but it really made me feel a great connection to people that I didn't even know, which I think is great for the spirit, however sad. So our spirit box wasn't giving us anything, literally not a single intelligible word. We weren't angry or disappointed, it was sort of a neat if we hear something, but understandable if we don't sort of thing, because we sort of assumed a majority of the items in there could not be haunted. They've got this doll, Demas, and when I say my heart rate increased just by typing her name, I'm not lying. She lives in a chicken wire cage toward the back of the first floor of the museum, and she is scary looking, not a normal looking doll. I got uneasy when I just saw her, and this is in a building full of frightening dolls. Maybe that's intentional though. Maybe they put her in a cage to raise your apprehension. There is a sign above her that says if you choose to speak to her, always say goodbye, which of course you should do with any spirit, I guess. But Demas is apparently particularly malicious. I'm a pretty bold soul, so as we're standing there together with the spirit box, I decided I wanted to talk with her. Hello, I said, and the spirit box just kept clicking. I didn't know what to talk to her about, but I'm always worried about lost spirits, so I decided to ask, are you okay? Without hesitation, the spirit box said, Amanda, extremely clearly. My boyfriend and I both heard it. I said, did it just? And he was like, yes, it absolutely just said your name. I said above that I was brave, but I was also immediately filled with a sense of dread. 
Something about it saying my name, and that we'd gotten absolutely nothing else out of that box the entire time we were there, was terrifying. And I do not scare easily. I didn't continue the conversation. I just said, goodbye, and ushered my boyfriend away from her, because I was so uncomfortable with her following that. Just now I went through their Facebook feed to see if I still felt the same about her and even saw an event where they let people hold her. I've never felt so appalled seeing such innocent looking photographs. That doll is the only item I have ever encountered that I am 100% sure is haunted and maybe even malicious. When I was younger, I used to collect porcelain dolls. They were my jam something fierce, and I got them for any sort of gift giving holiday and just because. I had over 200 of them, ranging from brand new from the store to very old from thrift shops and tag sales. So of course some of them were haunted. For the most part, they weren't bad though. One really liked a little chair I had a different doll in and would constantly knock it out of it until I put her in it, even though she didn't fit so well. And another that was really old but very pleasant to have around was kind of like a guardian. I felt so much safer with her in my room. But then there was him. Boy porcelain dolls are hard to come by. So when my stepmom found this cute magician boy at the store, she snagged him for me for some holiday. Now, he was brand new, like fresh from the store, never been opened, and there were more like him. He specifically wasn't special or odd or anything like that. I was thrilled to have him. He had a little stool that his little top hat sat on. He wore a standard little boy outfit with a generic starry magician cape and a black wand with white tips that tied to his hand to make it look like he was waving it. I put him on a shelf that was by the foot of my bed and next to the door, facing out into the room, not at my bed. One of the few open spots I had left for my ever-growing collection. That night, I had trouble sleeping and I had these weird, scary dreams. Nightmares aren't that unusual for me. I used to have them a lot when I was younger, but these were different than my usual ones. Dark and malicious, but still not abnormal. In the morning, he seemed to be facing my bed a bit more than before. I chalked it up to forgetting how I had placed him. Whatever, it was fine. The nightmares continued though, getting worse over the next several nights until I just couldn't handle it anymore. I'd wake up from something horrific and feel something malevolent staring at me from the doorway of my room, which was basically at the foot of my bed. Somehow, I just knew that it was the magician boy. He gave off this terrible vibe and the area around where I kept him just felt wrong. I finally told my stepmom what was happening and that I thought it was the boy and that I didn't want him anymore. He was too scary. She didn't disbelieve me, but she also said that I was overreacting and that since boy dolls were so hard to find, she would take him. I said yes, but I thought he should just get out of the house altogether. So she brings him downstairs to her room and sets him with the rest of her dolls also on a shelf between her bed and the door. That night, she's all snuggled up with her son, who I want to say was about three or four at the time they shared a bed, when he wakes her up in the middle of the night, a little spooked. She asks him what was wrong, and he points at the door and says, Mama, who's that? I don't like him. The doll was stored in the attic the next day, and sold on eBay a few days later. The weird nightmare stopped once he was gone, and the scary man was never seen again. Good luck whoever bought him.
My daughter has several old porcelain dolls. When she was nine, she got a sudden interest in them. I had never bought them for her because they're often very delicate and I didn't want her to break them. I took her to the Goodwill store and she begged for one. I let her buy it since she takes good care of her things. I quickly noticed that something was different in my house. I felt like I was being watched. Shortly after that, she asked for another doll at the Goodwill. Over the years, she has collected three. I noticed that she was very careful about which one she picked. She treats the dolls like gold and keeps them sitting up on the corner of her bed. She tells me the dolls like me since I'm so careful with them when I move them to make her bed. I see shadows around my house and I hear soft voices. Nothing that makes me feel in danger and I'm getting used to it, but it's just freaky and it never happened until we brought that first doll home. My story happened when I was nine years old. I'm 17 now, and I'm in Belgium. I shared the story with some friends, but I wanted more people to hear it. For my birthday when I was nine, I had tickets to go to Disneyland Paris with my mom. I was really happy because it was my first time there. It was really good, and I had a great time. After I did the Buzz Lightyear attraction, I asked my mom if I could have one of the toys, and she bought me one. I played with it sometimes, and I was the kind of kid that threw his toys around and found that funny. I did that with my Buzz Lightyear, but I was careful so I wouldn't break it. My toys never had a violent impact, it's not like I had an anger problem, I just liked to throw them and see what would happen. I stopped to play with it. But the thing is that one year later, he started to make these really random sounds and shoot his laser at night for no reason. I have glasses, but on my bed, I was able to see the red light and the sound was loud. The thing is that nothing was touching it and he doesn't have any kind of detection thing on him. Nothing was touching him, so it wasn't supposed to make a sound or talk or shoot or anything. Even if I was young, I didn't believe in ghosts, but this still scared me. It was making sounds only at night when I was in bed asleep, or trying to. I was really scared because it just never stopped. I remember asking my dad to please get it out of my room, so he put it in the basement. My basement is really small. But the really creepy thing, the really scary thing that happened, wasn't that. My house has two floors and it isn't that big. My toilet is super small and it's next to the basement door. When I was younger, I was really scared of the dark and I was holding my cat downstairs to go to the bathroom when I needed to and turn the light on because my cat brought me comfort. The scary thing that happened was it was two or three in the morning and it was really rare that I would ever wake up to go to the bathroom. My mom was often awake, but not that night. When I got down and started to walk to go to the bathroom, at the exact moment that I passed the basement door, my Buzz Lightyear doll started shooting and talking. I immediately went to the bathroom and I don't remember how much time I stayed in there. Even when I was in the bathroom, it was doing those noises and I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. At some moment, it was almost like the sound was getting closer and coming upstairs. I don't know if I was just hallucinating because I was really scared or if it was real. The problem is that I really don't remember how I got out of there. I really don't. I know that I probably would have just run up the stairs to get out of there as soon as I could, but I don't remember coming out of that bathroom or if the toys stopped talking and shooting but I do remember how scared I was. It was horrible to know that I was the only one awake, but at least I was okay and nothing dangerous happened to me. But it's still the worst night that I've ever had.
My dad died when I was 11. Every summer, we went to a little town which had a porcelain doll museum. I loved going there, hanging out with my dad, and I had several dolls myself, but one I loved the most. It resembled an Indian girl with two braids. I kept it on a shelf facing my bed, pushed into the corner of it. I had it for about three to four years, and I never touched it once. I just admired it. Well, as I mentioned, my dad died in December. Fast forward half a year later, it's June, summer holidays, and I'm laying on my bed with my laptop, chatting with my friend at midnight. Both my door and my window were open, but it was quiet outside, no wind, nothing. The doll suddenly fell to the floor. I was startled by the noise, but confused since it didn't shatter. The shelf was nearly two meters high, about six feet. So I turned off the lights, covered myself in a blanket and went to sleep, hoping that I could. I couldn't figure out how it could have fallen from that height and not broken. The next morning, the doll was still on the ground, face down. And I started to think, how could it have fallen? It was protected from any wind, even though there was none, and there were 40 centimeters of empty space in front of it. Someone would have had to pull it out and drop it. I got up, shaking, and slowly approached it. I sat on the floor and picked it up. The doll was intact, except for one thing. The left braid was cut in half. Not torn, cut. I quickly put it away and I never touched it again. I didn't even look at it. I still don't really know what happened. Sometimes I think that it was my dad, but I only think that to comfort myself. As I grow older, it doesn't seem logical. Why would my dad, who loved me the most, try to hurt my favorite doll that I got from him? My aunt has always been a lover of creepy things. She likes gory, spooky, haunted things. She's sort of the lovable oddball of the family. She's always been crazy about these things called living dead dolls. For those of you who don't know what they are, they're just terrifying looking collectible dolls. Basically purchasable nightmare fuel. She had bought a bunch of them and had them on display in her home. I've never been a fan of dolls, let alone ones meant to be scary, so this story creeps me out a lot. She ran into some financial trouble and decided to start selling things on eBay to make some extra cash for bills. As much as it broke her heart, she decided to sell one of her more popular living dead dolls on eBay. Almost immediately after she posted her doll, there was an offer. She said her goodbyes, boxed up the doll, and mailed it. No problem. A week or so later, she got the box back in the original packaging she sent it out in, but with a note saying undeliverable address, meaning she must have written it down wrong or it wasn't an acceptable place to deliver a package. My aunt figured it was just a spelling error and didn't think anything of it. She didn't open the package, she just put it in her closet. She went on eBay to try and contact the buyer. To her surprise, when she logged on, she already had a message from the buyer saying how she got the doll and how much she loved it and couldn't wait to brush its hair. She also described the doll in correct detail. My aunt was pretty freaked out. To this day, she still hasn't opened the package. It's just sitting in her closet. Edit. As a special Christmas gift, my aunt finally let me open the box. The doll was in it. So let me start with some background information first. 
My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning, and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll. Then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace. And then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things. So he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll. And so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it, and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit that might be lurking inside. Okay, so this is a story that took place when I was around eight years old in my neighborhood. I was next door neighbors with my best friend, Alex. We both went to the same school and always hung out every day after school. One day, I was bringing my Nintendo 64 to his house so that we could play together. Once I got into his house, his uncle was there watching the television so we couldn't use it. Today, I now know that he wasn't his uncle because my older sibling, who knew Alex's older sibling, told me that his parents rented out rooms to random people from their original hometown. So the uncle was just a random stranger from out of the country. He told us to go into his shed and search for an extra TV. So we opened the shed and started searching. We found an older television, but we couldn't use it. 
Then, something started moving all the things around. We thought it was a rat, so at first we didn't mind. But then we heard laughter, something so scary that I tried to leave, but Alex told me not to worry. We kept searching around for the laughter, and we eventually found this one doll that was around two feet tall. It was torn and battered, so we figured it was just broken. We just sat it down and decided to go hook up the television we'd found in his room. We played for a while until his uncle left the house for food and his parents were at work, so we were home alone. We started hearing noises at the house, but figured it was nothing. But then we heard the laughter. The doll was moving around the house carefully, which we saw through the small peak underneath the closed door. The doll was looking for something, which was probably us. We were both freaking out, but we knew we had to get away from the house. We opened the window and jumped out and ran toward my house. Somehow, the doll managed to look at us as we were running away through the window and just laugh. We stayed at my house all afternoon until his parents came home. Ever since that day, I've always had experiences, weird things at my friend's house, like having YouTube videos end abruptly and start playing other random things, like clown videos. I think it's a serial commercial from the 70s. I ignored all of these weird signs for the rest of my childhood, and recently we met up for a while since departing to different high schools. Somehow the topic of the weird things was brought up, and I asked if he remembered all those things. He did remember, which now makes me want to share the story, because apparently it wasn't just my imagination. I was no more than eight years old when I saw it. Even my sister, who was 10 years old, saw it. We lived with my grandparents at the time, but my grandpa often likes sleeping in the living room because he often wakes up at night to pray at our tiny altar. We don't always close our bedroom door. Basically, the living room was next to our bedroom and our bedroom was next to the bathroom. So we'd see if anybody were to go to the bathroom through our bedroom. One Saturday night, my sister and I stayed up late watching TV in the bedroom. The only light in the house that was on was in our bedroom. My grandpa chose to sleep in the living room again. It was past midnight, so we thought everybody in the neighborhood was asleep. That was until we saw my grandpa walking past our bedroom. We both stared at him until he disappeared from our sight. Of course, who would be scared? It's our grandpa. But for some reason, we had chills because he never came back out. We assumed he needed to go to the bathroom, but we never even heard the door close. And like I said, he never walked back the other way to go back to the living room. What creeped us out was how unusually straight he was walking, as if he was marching, like a soldier, and a bit too slow. It was almost like he was trying to scare us. It was a bit dark, but we knew it was him because of his features. So we called out to him. The first few calls garnered no reply. So we raised our voice so that he could hear us better. This time he came to us, but what shocked us was that he emerged from the living room instead of the bathroom. Note that my grandpa often wears all white clothing when he's at home. It didn't hit us until then that our grandpa was wearing colored clothing that day and not all white. The one that we saw was wearing a white sleeveless shirt and white shorts and was barefoot. So it couldn't have been him. This scared us even more. We asked our grandpa if he had gone to the bathroom just now. He said no, that he was asleep. It was impossible for him to have pranked us because there was no exit through the bathroom. The windows there are barred. We immediately told him about what we saw. He went to check, but saw nothing. 
We were scared kids. We didn't know what doppelgangers were until then. Our grandpa talked to us about doppelgangers. He said that's probably what we saw, that it was kind of well known in our area, and that if we saw any more, that we should immediately tell the original person about it, because if we don't, then something bad might happen to them. My sister and I never forgot about it. I would also like to share an incident that occurred a few years ago in a different part of my country. I forget the exact details, but it was on the news and all over social media. A young couple was killed in a motorcycle accident. I believe a bus ran over them. But what intrigued everyone was what the townsfolks said. They said that last night they saw the couple riding their motorcycle, wearing the same clothing. But what shocked them was that they were headless. I don't know if it's real or if they were just exaggerating, but the first thought everyone had was doppelgangers. Nobody knew who it was because they didn't have their heads. That was until people recognized the clothing that the dead couple was wearing the next day. Except the couples still had their heads, but their bodies were contorted in various ways. And everyone assumed that that was what the bad omen that the doppelgangers brought were trying to communicate. That story reminded me of what I saw when I was a kid, and I still don't have a decent explanation for either. When I was at art school in 1992, I was preparing for assessments, so I spent three days before the deadline awake and preparing everything at the last minute, which is my preferred style of doing things. I knew the house in which I lived then was haunted, and I hadn't seen anything manifest as such, but many times when I walked past the back door, it would shake as though the handle was being pulled on from outside. When there was no one there, and no rational reason for this to occur at all. That part of the house had a concrete slab as a floor, so the weight of a person crossing it had zero effect on the structure of the back room, so it couldn't cause the door to react in that way. One night, as I was walking past that door, I looked through the kitchen window into the kitchen, and I saw a figure sitting in the middle of the wall, as if defying gravity. After a second, I realized that the person I was looking at was actually me, wearing a blue two-piece suit with a short, neat haircut, grinning maniacally and looking into my eyes with a strange knowing. As I said, I knew the place already to be haunted, and so, when I saw this figure, I was mentally prepared for the door to shake as I passed it. So far, I was not shaken by the sight of this being, as I might have had I not already been experiencing so many spooky things. Having a general interest in the paranormal, I had also researched ghosts, and I knew what a doppelganger was, or a double walker, one that imitates a living being. I was forearmed with this knowledge, and I knew that traditionally, a doppelganger is believed to kill those to whom it appears, over time, through the excitation of a fear within them that gradually weakens its victim through repeated appearances, all of which somehow grant the entity an increasingly proportionate greater strength. And so, I deliberately ignored it as much as possible, and did not stop or react to it at all. Quickly returning to my room upstairs to continue my work, which at that time I was thoroughly obsessed with completing, I tried not to think anything else of it. The fact that I had so much work to do at that time also helped me to ignore this vision, but I kept it in mind as a memorable event to later consider when I would have more time to spare, and I forgot about it for the time being. Inevitably, I handed in my work for assessment and entered into the first weeks of my summer holiday. One day, I took acid and went back to the house and lay on my bed and tried astral traveling to the very edge of the cosmos to the point where matter expands into the void which exists outside of matter. I had the feeling that I actually got there and was instantly repelled back into my body. 
but I actually probably ended up just falling to sleep and waking up again, interpreting that as having achieved my goal. A little while later, my lovely caring mother asked if I would like to obtain some help trying to find a job for the summer. As she was aware, I was a poverty-stricken, dope-smoking art school student living on a small government grant, and she thought I probably needed her help, which was very nice of her. She drove me to the city and we looked through opportunity shops to look for some cheap but nice business-like clothes appropriate for job hunting. Then she paid for me to have my hair cut. At the end of our expedition that day, she dropped me off at home and I walked in, still wearing the $15 suit that she'd bought for me. Out of vain curiosity, I hurried to the downstairs bathroom mirror to check out my new haircut. Looking at myself in the mirror, it was then that I remembered and realized that with my hair cut short like that, and in that suit, which was a blue two-piece pinstripe, I looked identical to what I had seen sitting in the middle of the kitchen wall that night, just weeks earlier. I distance hike when I can. Sometimes this means getting up early or staying out late to get as many miles in as possible. Sometimes walking in the pitch dark with a low light headlamp gets spooky. I grew up in the woods of this area. I've slept under the canopy of stars more nights than I can count. I've trekked thousands of miles of trail, riverbank, lake shore, ridge bottoms, bogs and creeks. I've hunted the game. I'm establishing this because it's important that you understand that I have heard, seen, and smelled about all this region has to offer in the way of wilderness. My scariest experience, though, happened at about 4.30 in the morning. It was late spring, so the first morning light wouldn't be visible in the treetops for another 30 to 45 minutes. Another hour passed that until sunrise. I was on mile five. I'm in a low bottom that's wedged between two steep ridges. The trail I'm on was narrow, muddy, and completely hemmed in by thick underbrush, young maple, and old oak growth. I'm focused on the small light from my headlamp, just one step after the other, zoned out. Then I heard a loud crack, and I froze solid. This is the part I have trouble describing. 4.30 in the springtime means I'm the only thing making noise. No birds chirping, nothing dead quiet. Mid-step, I froze. When fight or flight kicks in, you have these immediate instinct thoughts. The thought that instantly flashed in my mind as I stood there, balancing myself into silence was, if I hear that again, I'm turning around and going back the way I came in a hurry. Why? Because that sound was not a branch breaking. It wasn't deadfall. It wasn't a widow maker. I was sure that I had just heard something intentional. Hearing it twice? Well, that meant to get out of there. To describe it as best I can, it sounded like a decent-sized wooden stick being violently whacked against a small tree. More a fungo bat-sized stick than a baseball bat. The distinction in my head being that this sound was a crack, not a thud or a thump. I've described it in the past as explosive because it was so terribly loud and sudden. I had the sense that it was about 50 yards directly in front of me, and it was loud and clear. Now as I stood there, completely spooked, I realized the soon-to-be worst part of my situation. I knew where the sound had come from, and I knew where the trail went. In about 30 yards, I was going to come across a 180-degree turn and start up the ridge going away from the creek. This meant that as soon as I got the courage to move toward the noise, I was going to have to turn my back to it and get up that ridge. This made me very nervous. My head is somewhere between there's a murderer and there's Bigfoot, and I really didn't know which. Minutes pass. I just breathe the foggy breath and listen. Nothing. Dead quiet. I've got about 20 to 30 minutes until first light, so I crank up the headlamp and start to slowly creep toward that turn. When you wear a headlamp in the woods at night, 
Every tree branch in front of you casts a big black moving shadow on the trail. That didn't help. I get to the turn and quickly make the bend. I'm moving pretty fast at this point, trying to be quiet, taking tiny shallow breaths so I can listen, and then I smell it. A stench hits me that I can't describe. I just imagined wet, rotten death. I've actually worked scenes where humans have expired in a past life as a firefighter. This was like days old decomposition, but it just smelled strange. I kept walking, fast. By the time I made the top of the ridge, I was huffing and puffing, and the first light was showing. I didn't stop moving until full light was out and the birds were chirping. I've heard it all in the woods. I've smelled it all. I'm telling you, I don't know what that was. Deadfall, and especially leafed out branches, make a lot of noise on the way down. I've heard that many times. This wasn't that. But what it was, I don't know. Before I tell you my stories, it might be helpful to tell you more about my background. I'm a 23-year-old boy whose family moved during the Yugoslavian War in 1999 from eastern Serbia to Switzerland. We used to live in a small village across the Danube at the Bulgarian and Romanian border, a region that has a very colorful history. Many bloody historic events occurred on the soil where we lived. Roman emperors used to rule this area as well as many historical figures, such as Attila the Hun, Alexander the Great, or Vlad the Impaler, all of which resided here once and fought battles. The region has been occupied many times. The longest used to be under the Ottomans. This occupation lasted for almost three centuries. After the Ottoman occupation, the country didn't have much time to recover and the First and Second World War had struck the country already. Many people died during the First World War, about a third of the population. As a result, guerrilla groups like Setniks, Partisans, etc. were formed, killing even more people. In conclusion, many people were unjustifiably tortured and lost their lives, which is probably why there are many occurrences of the paranormal here. Magic is also very common here, the so-called Vlak Magic, or Vlaska Magica, in Valation, is said to be one of the strongest in the world, and many people tend to practice it and religiously believe in it. As a result, there are many stories about paranormal events. One of my favorite ones is a story my grandfather told me. He grew up in the forest in a small and old house, about 300 years old. He was adopted by my great-grandfather who used to be a leader in one of the upcoming resistance movements against the socialist regime after the Second World War. He fought in both world wars and, even with all this, he took great care of my grandfather and loved him as if he was his own child. Fifty years passed since he left his home and all of those people living here died, but my grandpa still visits this house and stays overnight there. This place creeps me out, even during the day, there's an aura to this place that just makes it uncomfortable to be there. I can't imagine staying there overnight, but he frequently does. And one day he told me a very strange story. While he stays there, he says he often gets visited. At first I thought visit like the ones you get from neighbors or something, but he told me that one night he woke up to a hand crawling over his head it was a huge, white, pale man kneeling next to him and sort of crawling over his head, speaking with a calm voice in Vlaski, the dying language that we used to speak here, which is a mix of Moldavian and Romanian. He told me that his skin was white and that it was glowing in the night. He didn't have any hair and the hand felt very soft. My grandfather has always respected the dead and was never really afraid. He told me that he didn't really speak to him and just enjoyed his company, since he knew in some way that he wasn't evil. Another time, he told me that he used to fix small parts around the house. 
When it started to get dark, he slowly began getting ready to leave his tractor because it takes like an hour to reach the next civilized place. While putting stuff back into the barn, he heard loud noises in the attic. It didn't bother him until a plank was thrown down the stairs. He recalled one time they even threw down a rock into the wheelbarrow that he was pushing into the barn. He told me he just turned around, locked the barn, and didn't even frown. They expect you to react, he said. Don't give them this pleasure. He told me this while laughing, then said, it makes them go crazy. Growing up, I heard a lot of these stories, and it really does run in our family, having these experiences from time to time. The scariest thing that happened to me occurred during the summer of 2009. My grandfather told me during this summer break, as usual, stories from the past of how he used to walk these woods alone in the dark and what he experienced while doing so. And since I was in my teen years, I started to question the reliability of his stories. From time to time, I took out my old motor bicycle and drove it out into the forest. Driving around was the only time I could really think about stuff and, you know, be in this type of state where you question everything and think about the world. So one day, I took out my bike and decided to drive around. I still don't know why or how, but somehow I found myself driving to the old house that he grew up in. I didn't really bother to question why my intention was to drive there, so I just kept going. I always believed that I was a kid, pure by hearth, and no evil could ever come to me. While I was driving out, I thought about the probabilities of actually encountering a vampire. I live, as I mentioned, in East Serbia, where vampires are still widely believed in. My grandpa always told me not to go out past dark, but I didn't really care, so I still kept going. Remembering back, I thought that his intention was to keep me scared so I didn't get lost in the woods. But being a teenager at the time, I thought I was invincible. And in fact, even if a vampire did cross my path, that I would pass by him with no harm. There aren't really streets there, it's just a dirt road between trees that leads to what seems like nothing. After an hour, even the dirt road started to vanish. While I was driving and thinking about how strong I was, I noticed that my hand felt very wet. I thought it was because I was sweating, since this region can get very hot. After taking a look at my hand, I saw that there was blood all over it. At first I thought it might have been a bug that I had squished, but there was just too much blood for that. So I started to look for wounds, but my hand seemed perfectly fine. My heart slowly began racing, and I took a sharp turn and drove back home. I remember this to be the moment that I was the most scared in my life. I had the urge to look behind me every second that I was driving through the forest. It felt like someone was sitting behind me just waiting for me to fall down. After arriving home and telling my grandpa, he just started laughing and told me never to question their abilities again. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown, and I would take him with me everywhere. In the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail. 
I had the same exact dream every time, and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair with my clown doll sitting in it staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, open, with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors, the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose. And on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it, but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad and I told it to leave me alone and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point haunting me. I started getting really into it and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me and he said something for the first time and I woke up. I can't remember what it was, I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave, or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me and I have them on my desk and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. I was hiking a section of the North Umpqua Trail in the northern part of Southern Oregon a few years back with my sister-in-law. It's a 72-mile trail broken into sections that can be easily hiked in a day. At the time, I lived about midway up the trail, fairly remote, in a small community. It was mid-fall this one day when we set out. The trail was running along the south side of the North Umpqua River, and was pretty up and down in the beginning. 
We made it to a fairly flat section that was running just above the river. There was this beautiful view of the river through the trees, so we stopped to get some pictures and take a water break. I immediately felt extremely uncomfortable, like somebody was watching us. I slowly turned my head to look behind us, across the trail, and up. At the top of this very small incline, I could see a small meadow through the trees. Across the meadow, maybe 15 yards from us, was a tent an old canvas-style tent. As I'm looking, I notice bones strung from the trees all around the meadow, like creepy death wind chimes. My stomach just clenched and dropped. I leaned into my sister-in-law and whispered, Do not, not turn around and look behind us. Just continue walking up the trail and run when I tell you. We were close enough to the river that nobody who wasn't immediately next to us could have heard this. She did exactly as I told her to do, setting off at the brisk walk we'd been at before. We got maybe ten yards, and I could hear footsteps through the forest floor, coming from behind and slightly above us. That part of the forest is very dense. There's thick moss cover under the trees, so footsteps on it make a very specific sound. I leaned forward and told her to pick up her speed. She did. I did. And so did whoever was behind us. I leaned forward again and told her to run as fast as she could and not to stop until I told her so. For two middle-aged women, both slightly overweight, we ran like the wind. I just kept telling her, go, go, go. I could see ahead of us that the trail had an incline and then veered to the right along the river and around a cliff. I knew at that point that whoever it was was going to have to come down onto the trail or stop. We kept running. We probably ran at least a mile after that, even though we could no longer hear anybody behind or above us. That section of the trail was about nine miles and we weren't halfway when this happened. We eventually slowed down, but just hurried as fast as we could the rest of the way. We had arranged for her younger brother to pick us up. We made it to the next trailhead fairly early, so we made our way out to 138 and started walking east toward home, knowing that he would find us. He did, and was shocked at our story. We got home and immediately called our local sheriff, who lived just above us at the ranger station. He came to the house and heard our story. He explained that it might be a day or two before they could get on the trail as they had a missing hunter at the time that they were searching for. So a few days go by and he shows up at our house to let me know that we weren't crazy or imagining things and that somebody really did chase us. I asked what they found and who it was. He looked at the floor and then looked up and said, I'm not going to tell you what we found or who it was because if I do, You'll never hike anywhere ever again. What we found was not normal, and it won't happen up here again. He then instructed me to never, ever hike unarmed again. I never found out what they found, or who it was. I never hiked that section of trail again, and it completely burned last year. I also never hike unarmed, ever. That was huge for me because I wasn't really a gun person at the time. But I am a living person and I'd like to stay that way, so I took his advice. I had many incidents living up there in the national forest with wild animals and other strange things, but nothing ever scared me as much as another human did that day. This happened when I was 13 or 14. This was probably one of the last times that I went consistently to see my aunt. She lived very close to a mountain near Oaxaca. Her husband, my uncle, was a pretty wealthy guy. He sold and bred livestock. He had a lot of horses, cattle, goats, and dogs. Their house was a pretty big place with lots of land for the animals. 
Of course, their house was very isolated. The closest town was quite a ways away. We went there one year to stay with her, and everything was normal for the first few days. When the weird things started happening, it was early in the morning. I wear wristwatches, and I always take mine off to go to bed and put it back on after I brush my teeth and whatnot. I remember waking up, grabbing my watch, and putting it on the top shelf of this shelf outside the bathroom, brushing my teeth, and coming back to find it gone. I thought for a second, and I looked around the shelf and under it, but I couldn't find it. I went back to the room I was staying in and looked around there, and it wasn't there either. I thought maybe one of my siblings was playing with me, and I looked around, but all three of my siblings were fast asleep on the floor. That's when I started getting, not scared, but worried. I go to look around the shelf once more, and I still can't find it. I remember saying out loud, whoever took my watch, give it back because I'm getting mad. I walk away to put my shoes on and from the living room, I could hear a slight noise. It was my alarm on my watch going off. I peeked my head into the hallway and I could see the blue light from my watch. That's when I got scared. I walked up to it and put it on and got a really uneasy feeling. I go to watch TV and I see my aunt walking into the kitchen. I say good morning and I ask her if she grabbed my watch. She says no, but not to leave valuables in the open. I asked her why and she says, the duendes will take them and hide them. I gave an uncomfortable laugh and said, right. She obviously saw that I thought she was crazy. She told me she was serious and that the duende probably grabbed my watch. In my mind, I'm thinking, this lady is nuts. Later on that day, I asked my mom if duendes were real. She gave me a concerned look and asked me why. I told her that my aunt said that there were duendes in the house. She steered away from the question and just said, if you feel scared, just start to pray. I didn't think about it much after that. I remember that we watched a movie in the living room and I fell asleep on the couch. I woke up to a thud coming from the kitchen and footsteps running from the kitchen. The footsteps were light, but still audible, kind of like when a cat runs. I see lights turn on from the hallway and I see my aunt running toward the kitchen. I hear her say, Mendingos duendes which means roughly damn elves. I slowly get up and peek into the kitchen and it's a huge mess. A lot of stuff knocked over, most of it food. I asked if an animal got in, maybe a raccoon. She's so irritated by the mess, she just says, Duendes. I roll my eyes and look at my watch. It was almost 4 a.m. I decided to help her clean up. We finished cleaning up in about 20 minutes, and that's when I helped her with the dustpan. It was one of the sucky ones where you have to crouch over and hold it. When I crouch over, I look to the huge pile of food and I can see either sugar or flour. And that's when I made out little tiny footprints. Not like baby footprints, but smaller, like if a lizard had human feet. I look to my aunt and she says, I know, I saw them. I told you. I'm still not completely convinced, so I go to bed and I wake up and nothing happens for a few days. The last experience I had with these things was when I was sleeping and woke up for some reason, or rather no reason at all. I remember feeling uneasy, trying to figure out why I was awake. I could hear those footsteps again as something small was running in front of the bed. I sit up fast and I see a small shadow running weird, like it was kind of waddling but still moving really fast. All this happened in a matter of seconds. I turn on the lights and nothing is there. I couldn't make the shadow out, but it was small, maybe a foot tall. That's when I started believing in them. I was so uneasy after that and I was glad I was getting out of there. 
I may have been a skeptic going into it, but after that visit, I am a believer in Duendes. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county. Along with the job comes the unfortunate familiarity with what a decomposing human body smells like. To me, it's very similar to an animal carcass, but with a much sweeter odor. Not sweet in the sense that I enjoy it, hell no. That smell normally means a bad night for me and another gruesome memory to add to my catalog of things I would rather forget. With that out of the way, I'll get to what happened. Last night, I was patrolling a geographically isolated area of the county, which is very large and sparsely populated. Having completed the hour-long trek to the northwestern county line, I began driving through the mountains back toward civilization. About 25 miles from town, or the closest semblance thereof, I hit a straight stretch of highway through a wide valley. Since the weather was nice, I had my windows rolled down. As I passed the entrance of an old logging road, that familiar smell of sweet rot suddenly filled my car. Not just a whiff, a cloud of it filled the cab as if there was a weak old human corpse sitting in the front seat next to me. It was all too familiar, but this time there was something else that I couldn't place. It lingered for a few moments, then went away just as quickly as it had entered. Realizing what I had just smelled, my heart sank and I pulled to the side of the road. I told myself it was just a dead animal in the ditch and that my mind was playing tricks on me. I turned my car around and drove slowly back toward the logging road. The closer I got to it, the smell became stronger and I grew more certain that I was about to find a body. Holding on to a shred of hope that I was wrong, I parked my unit on the side of the highway just before the dirt road. I radioed to dispatch, told them my location and that I would be out of my unit for a moment. I didn't say why to avoid an awkward disregard on a possible body on the side of the road. I shined my flashlight into the ditch and into the encroaching briars and weeds as I walked closer to where I believed the source of the smell was. Once I was a few yards away from the dirt road, I saw the opening of a concrete culvert going under the highway. At this point, the smell was nearly as strong as it had been when I first passed. The opening of the culvert was about three feet in diameter, just large enough to hide a body inside. I cursed and held my breath as I leaned over and shined my light inside. An empty tunnel stretched the width of the highway. Somewhat relieved, I stood and looked around. It smelled as if I was standing on top of whatever was emitting the odor. I searched around the brush for a moment, but found nothing. Thinking the origin might be on the opposite side of the highway, I crossed to the other ditch to continue searching. As I walked away from the other side of the road, the smell grew faint. I stopped at the opposite end of the culvert and peeked inside, just to double check. The odor was nearly gone at this point. I stood up and checked my surroundings when I heard a crack in the brush behind me and the smell engulfed me even stronger than before. Thinking for a moment that the wind must have shifted, I froze when I realized the air was dead still. Whether it was fear or something else, a shiver went down my spine. In the distance, I saw headlights coming down the highway. As the car came near, the odor seemed to move away, farther into the bushes toward where I had heard the crack. The car stopped, and the passenger rolled down the window and asked if I was all right. I lied and told him that I was. I thanked him for checking, and I walked briskly to my car as they drove away. I got the hell out of there. Once I was able to get cell service, I called my friend who was patrolling the opposite side of the county. I explained what had happened, trying not to let on that I was spooked. Once I was done, he paused for a moment, then asked about the unusual hint of something which accompanied the smell. He asked if it was sulfur, 
and I put two and two together. It was sulfur that I had smelled. I asked if he thought I had found a demon in the middle of nowhere, to which he responded with a concerned, yes. This guy is the son of a missionary and has been all around the world. He has seen, rather smelled, this before and told me that it was a very concerning experience. This spooked me even more because his responses were very out of character for him. Maybe something else happened. Maybe there's some shred of a possibility that there's a scientific explanation. But honestly, I think I agree with my friend. I think there's a demon in the valley. I'm telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despised the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now, these are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced-in area around the house. It's always in shade. No thick undergrowth, just trees. Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual. But it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too, even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud, rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, Whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it. It just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. 
my mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal? Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there.
Everything happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll give you the facts of what happened and you can come to your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy. We'll call him Paul. We hit it off immediately, and one day he suggested that we go hiking in the woods. I'm originally from Russia, so I was practically raised in the woods. I spent half of my childhood in them, and I was really excited about his proposal. As we're hiking, it starts raining, like pouring rain. I've never seen anything like it. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there are no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep into the woods already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee just the bare wooden structure of it, and thought that it was pretty cool, so we kept going in that direction. Suddenly, we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby. It is a forest, so lots of animals can imitate that sound, like deer, cubs, etc. And the cry sounded distant anyway, so we thought nothing of it and walked forward. Within seconds, we heard this thing right next to us, which seemed strange, since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud now that it could have been a few feet away. We start looking all around, even looking up into the trees, and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation, so we kind of speed walked in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again. It was like something was telling us to book it, so we did. We ran faster than what was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods. Both of us agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately, websites like Most Haunted Forests in Illinois started to pop up. Turns out that the place was the site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprising, since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. And apparently, it's where three young boys were brutally murdered and left naked in a ditch. Pretty dark stuff. Paul and I went back and I kind of forgot about the incident. Until one evening after work, he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and he wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20-something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb, I come along, thinking that at least I could try to keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and we drive over there. Traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn so we get there at around 11 p.m. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us, except right at the edge of the road, and flashlights can only do so much, so our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river, into the actually deep part of the forest. As soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place, but this was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Ryan, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic, one that I've never felt before in any forest and I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks, and suddenly, we hear crunching, coming toward us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking toward the bridge. 
No one talks until we get to the other side. And Ryan says, I, I was just nervous because, you know, I might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Right. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side. And that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunk one. She just seemed to be almost... I don't know the right word for it, but vibrating, undulating, I'm not sure. But there wasn't a building around for miles, just straight road. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the side of the road killing drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave this girl all alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we got to her. I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around, and with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips, she nods. I was hit with that same feeling that I had gotten back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died, well, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car, right behind my seat and next to Ryan, and he just starts to chat her up, flirting, asking her where she's from and what she's doing. Typical. All this time, I'm turned halfway around keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is going to happen. She's keeping steady eye contact with me the entire time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that slow, creepy smile, while slightly undulating, I still don't know what to call it, but it seemed snake-like. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods her head yes, except there's not a single bar anywhere even close, not for miles and miles. She said she was walking home, and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car along nothing but forest. My eyes literally hurt from keeping eye contact with her, and she just keeps smiling and undulating and giving off this feeling of dread. This feeling just keeps increasing, so eventually we drop her off at her street. There are lots of old looking smaller houses there. When I turn back to look at her a second later, She's completely gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. My husband saw my doppelganger in our hallway last night. We live in an old farmhouse, and we've had many paranormal and unexplained spirits, noises, and so on. We've had paranormal investigators over to our house, and we're waiting on the report. Last night, I was in the bathtub. My husband came into the bathroom to wash his hands and went back out to do laundry. He was in the laundry room, and looked through the kitchen and saw what he thought was me in the hallway. Apparently, I was buck naked. He called my name and he said that whoever this was turned her face toward him and gave him a look like she didn't know who he was. Then she walked a step behind a column and our son came out from the same column going the opposite way. Our son asked who my husband was talking to. When my husband said he was talking to me, my son said that I wasn't there. He'd never seen me. My husband came into the bathroom where I was still in the tub, and he made me swear up and down that I had never left the tub. He was very freaked out and made us follow him from room to room for the rest of the night and announce ourselves if we came into a room where he was. He had spoken to a medium a few months prior. She's coming Saturday to bless us and our home. She said she would try to see what spirits were there and try to release them. 
and also she told me to place black salt around our doorways and the four corners of our home. It's easily the weirdest thing we've ever experienced. Does anyone else have a doppelganger story? I'm a 39-year-old woman, and I had a really strange dream last night. In my dream, when I turned my back, my 10-year-old self was looking at me. I was quite shocked to see her, and I asked, What are you doing here? She didn't say anything and left the room. I regretted my reaction and thought, Oh, now she would think she wasn't wanted. I had to fix it. I left the room in the hopes of finding her. And there she was, doing her homework in my grandmother's small room. When she noticed me, she smiled at me, and I felt love for her. I just remember thinking, oh, she's alone and trying so much, as always. And then I woke up. When I told the dream to my mother, she told me that I always did my homework in that room when I visited my grandmother's. Somehow, I had no recollection of it until that dream. I know dreams are dreams, but this one just felt like it had a deeper meaning, and I wanted to share. For reference, I live in Sweden, and my family is very anti-religious. The house we live in is fairly old, dating back around a hundred years. My dad is a very productive person, always getting new hobbies on the fly. One day he decided to start a bee farm in our backyard. When you take care of bees, you need room that is very clean too to keep out the bacteria from the honey. He decided to use our shed in the backyard, which is extremely small. The room can only fit about two people. In the room, we have one desk, which has a couple of drawers in it. In those drawers, we keep all of the necessary equipment when making the jars of honey. My dad had to put labels on each jar of honey, which is a very tedious process. The labels are on a huge scroll, about the size of an average adult's small arm in diameter. My dad and I were putting labels on the jars for about 30 minutes before he goes outside for about 10 seconds to get some air. I can see him the entire time. When he goes out, he puts the scroll on the top of the desk. During this time, I was watching and I took out my phone. When he comes back in, we proceed to start again, but out of nowhere, he asks me where I put the scroll. I told him that he put the scroll on the top of the desk but it's not there. Without the scroll of labels, we couldn't continue working. We start looking all over the room, but nothing. As I described earlier, the room was tiny, which is why it's so odd for something to disappear. We searched everywhere, behind the desk, in each drawer, outside, but still nothing. This happened about a year ago, and it's still freaking me out. Usually when my family and I experience something paranormal, we just blame it on something logical and ignore it. But this incident cannot be explained. There is seriously nowhere for that thing to have disappeared to, and that's why it's freaking me out. Even in the unlikely event of it rolling outside, my dad and I would have easily spotted it or just heard it. Moral of the story is, gnomes might still exist in Sweden. About five years ago, my wife and I got into a pretty big argument right after our son was first born. We were all heading to the pharmacy that morning but both of us, being immature, decided to go separately. I had the day off, so I brought my son with me. It was only about a quarter of a mile up the street from my house, so we planned on walking. 
Well, I left a little late, and I didn't see my wife in the house prior to me leaving, because of us avoiding each other. And when I got about a minute from there, I see my wife turn the corner, so I'm kind of not looking at her. But then when we pass, we both kind of mean mugged each other and didn't say a word. I go in, I get my script, and I get home. Well, she's laying on the couch in her pajamas and not even getting ready for work. So I tapped her and I said, what the heck, you're not getting ready for work. Why did you change out of your clothes? Are you not going to work now? And she was like, what are you talking about? I've been laying here in my pajamas. I'm just gonna go get my script and a few things that I was gonna get later. I was like, you didn't go to the pharmacy earlier? I just walked past you like 10 to 15 minutes ago when you were leaving. You gave me that evil, dirty look, so I gave you the same one in return. She starts saying that I'm crazy and must have been hallucinating and what did I take? I totally didn't believe her. I thought she was just gaslighting me, trying to make me feel like I was losing my mind. But later that night when we were cooled down, we all went to Walmart together to get her scripts and a few of the things that she needed. I literally felt like I was in the twilight zone. I kept saying like, come on, Jill, quit messing with me. She swore up and down and actually started getting a little irritated that I kept pressing her about it. Ultimately, I believe her that she had never left the house. It was one of the weirdest experiences that I've ever had. After I believed her that it really wasn't her, things started sticking out to me, like the look she gave me and how things about her face just were a little off. Even when she's mad at me, the look that she gives me is never that evil. And that's exactly what this look was. Just evil. Like even at resting neutrality, this face would have been full of evil and hatred. It was just like that. But still at the time, we locked eyes and I was totally convinced it was my wife. I still have no idea what happened. The experience that I'm relaying here happened to one of my best friends who stays with his grandmother who's in her mid eighties. One day, her daughter picked her up and they went shopping together. My friend Rob went into his bedroom to watch TV right after they left. About a half an hour later, he heard some noise coming from the kitchen. So he poked his head out the door to see what it was. He saw his grandmother in the kitchen, facing away from him, digging furiously through her junk drawer, obviously searching for something. He just shrugged and went back into his room Another hour and a half passes and he comes out into the living room. That's when he see his aunt's van pull up to the house and his grandmother and aunt come in carrying all of her parcels. He then became uneasy and asked her if she found what she was looking for in the kitchen. She looked at him like he was nuts and said that she had been gone for hours and that she had never been looking in the kitchen drawer that day. He then explained that he had seen her and that whoever it was had on the exact same clothes and the same hair. He started laughing, thinking that she was just trolling him, but his aunt looked very concerned and verified that they had not returned after their initial departure. Rob began to freak out, and when he told me what happened later that day, he was glad that he didn't see its face, whatever it was. I believe him, because he's never told a story even remotely close to this one, and he seemed really unsettled by the whole incident. Honestly, I would be too. Has anyone else noticed an increase in doppelganger sightings recently? I just had one yesterday at the library where I work. My coworker and I saw a patron, a regular who we see almost every day, walk in in sweatpants. Neither of us saw him leave. 
About 15 minutes later, the same man walked in through the one and only entrance and exit, this time wearing something completely different and more formal. My coworker and I stared at each other, completely puzzled. I asked him how he had walked past me so fast that I didn't even notice and why he had changed clothes. He looked at me like I was crazy. He claimed that he had been home all day and this was his first time stopping by. My coworker told him what happened and he was visibly freaked out. It freaked us all out because we looked around for this doppelganger and whoever it was had completely vanished. There is, like I said, only one way in and one way out for patrons. The other doors are either emergency exits, which would have set off the alarms, or the staff entrance, which is a highly restricted area. There was no way he could have left in that short a time without at least one of us noticing. There are no cameras in the building, so there's no way to see how this person could have left. But the only phenomenon that I can attribute this to is the mystery of doppelgangers. I'm very interested in the paranormal, but I'm not a researcher or an investigator. Just a fan, I guess. It seems like there's been an increase in doppelganger sightings. Has anyone else noticed this? I wonder what it could mean. At around 11 years old, I was in my room, sleeping on the top bunk. My sister was asleep on the bottom bunk. Across from my bed was my dresser with a large mirror. If you're laying and you look to the left, the mirror is there. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and looking at the mirror, and I saw what looked like myself sitting on the bottom bunk, staring at me through the mirror with a grin except she looked like she was sitting backwards so that she had to turn her head to look toward the mirror, if that makes sense. I was really confused and really creeped out. I stared at it for a while, thinking that maybe it was my sister. I even called out her name, but it wasn't. I strained my eyes to try and see better in the dim lighting, but I got too freaked out, so I turned around and tried to go back to sleep. The next morning, I find a handprint on the mirror. I was beyond spooked at this point. That house always had weird activity too. Bottles in the bathroom randomly crashing down. Once I heard a man shout, hey, when I was alone and leaving for school. Very strange house. I know some might say that this was a dream and maybe it was, but I know that I was wide awake. It felt so real. I remember it vividly. I remember trying to get back to sleep afterward. I'll never forget, though, the feeling of staring at myself, staring back at me, so menacingly. I want to tell you a story about my mother's encounter with a doppelganger. It was about nine years ago when my mom was doing a late shift. She was still an accountant at the time, so she had to work extra hours to complete her work. She told me that at about 11.20, she went for a quick coffee when she sighted a person exactly like her that went past by the break room. She thought she was just being paranoid and that her eyes were tired she was scared that it was a thief though, so she brought her personal bag with her just in case. She went down for the coffee, then came back to the working station. But as she stood at the door of the break room, the doppelganger was standing there right by the computer. My mother was terrified as it just stood there looking at the computer. Luckily, a security officer was doing his last rounds to turn off the electricity and he saw my mom. He touched her, which brought her back to reality. But this time, the officer noticed the doppelganger. He seemed to understand what was going on and proceeded to escort my mom out of the building. When they were outside, 
He explained to her that it was a bad omen and told her to change where she worked. She did and got a promotion about two months after the incident. She never saw her double again.